Greetings, Internet. This is Lave26. I'm here to talk to you about the T-Card for the Intellivision. T-Cards were used by game developers way back in the day to develop games for the Mattel Intellivision game console. A developer would write and compile their game code on a computer, program the code into the EEPROM chips, and install those EEPROM chips into the T-Card. After that, they'd plug the T-Card into the Intellivision and test out the game. Multiple designs of T-Cards existed, each with differing capabilities, but they all behaved similarly. Using T-Cards was just one of the ways to develop games back then. Sometimes T-Cards left the development office to get software out in the wild. Those T-Cards are notable because they are encased in a large plastic shell. Due to their large size, they were never sold to consumers in normal Intellivision game boxes. Rather, they were only used for non-end-user scenarios. For example, some early versions of the International Demonstration cartridge were sent as large T-cards before the more common and smaller International Demonstration cartridges were manufactured. Lastly, T-cards are occasionally called T-carts, with carts being short for cartridge. Enough talk. Let's fire this thing up. Okay, V3.3 in the corner tells us this T-card is an Intellivision 2 test cartridge, which was used to diagnose problems with the Intellivision 2 hardware. After running through the tests, there typically is a game at the end for the tester to play as extra confirmation that the system is working. Whoa! Check this out! This is Brickout! It ends with Brickout! It was an unreleased game! It was supposed to be part of the triple action game cartridge, but was yanked due to legal fears. It's so cool seeing this run on a T-card. Okay, a few folks have probably already figured this out. This T-card is not an original one from back in the day. Instead, this particular T-card is a modern reproduction. I took the Intellivision 2 test ROM data, merged it with the game data for Brickout, and burned it into these six EEPROMs. Before I go into technical details for the T-card, I would like to thank Frank Palazzolo for sending me the bare PCB. Frank has been working with Evan Allen, also known as Absman, who did much of the KeyCAD schematic and layout for the modern reproduction of the card. Evan has publicly hosted this design in his Absman GitHub account. It can be freely downloaded from the link displayed in both the video and in the description below. This GitHub repository contains not just one, but multiple designs. One modern T-card design is an exact replica of the most advanced and capable design from back in the day. Another design is very similar, but makes some small improvements with a reduction in the chip count. A third design is even more advanced, and instead of the card being shaped like the letter T, it uses a modular, stackable approach that can theoretically support even more RAM and ROM than was originally possible. Besides GitHub, Evan has a blog post about his T-card work. A link to that blog post is also in the description below. Broadly speaking, various portions of the board handle different functionality. Because the Intellivision uses a time-multiplexed bus, meaning that address signals and data signals share the same pins at different times, this part of the board here is responsible for storing the address when it appears on the bus. This large area of the board has four copies of the same circuit. Thus, the following description applies equally to each of these four banks. These two sockets hold either RAM chips or ROM chips. They are typically installed as matching pairs of 8-bit wide ROM or 8-bit wide RAM to handle the full 16-bit width of the Intellivision bus. This chip holds the high 8 bits, and this chip holds the low 8 bits. If only one chip of the pair is installed, such as only needing for 8-bit wide RAM, then one chip is installed in this socket for the lower RAM bits. The max size supported by each socket is 4 kilobyte ROM chips or 2 kilobyte RAM chips. Up here, these chips and the dip switches handle decoding whether this bank is enabled, whether the bank contains ROM or RAM, and what memory address the bank is assigned to. 
Before going into detail about the dip switch settings, I should mention that my particular board is an early version that used pull down resistors instead of pull up resistors. Thus, my switches rock the opposite direction seen on later boards. That said, the switches are fairly straightforward. These four switches here set the upper nibble of the starting address for the chips. For example, these switches are set to 1, 0, 1, 0 in binary, which is also 5 in hexadecimal. That means this bank is set to address 5000. This switch here controls whether the chips are ROM chips or RAM chips. Since the supported RAM chips are half the size of the supported ROM chips, this next switch here controls whether the RAM is put in the low half or high half of the address range. If this was RAM, this setting would put the RAM starting at address 5000. And now it's set to address 5800. The next to last switch controls the overall enable setting for the bank. Here the bank is turned on, and now the bank is turned off. This last switch controls nothing. To give some examples of supported chips, ROM code can be stored in Intel 2732 compatible EEPROM chips. Supported SRAM chips include the 6116 compatible chips, such as the Mitsubishi M5872-5P. If you're interested in long-term data storage, such as game save states, then battery-backed SRAM can be used, such as the Dallas DS1220. If you have concerns about battery leakage, then theoretically FRAM can be used as an alternative, although it may be tricky to find or adapt modern FRAM chips to the 24-pin socket. It should be mentioned that long-term data storage for game save states only works if the game was coded to support that feature. Merely installing battery-backed SRAM is not going to magically add saving game data for the original in television games such as Astro Smash. As a recommendation, installing or removing chips is best done using the right tools to avoid potentially physically damaging the chips, particularly with bending or breaking pins. While not strictly necessary, these tools are inexpensive. Here is an example chip insertion tool. And here is an example chip extractor. Also, since most of these chips have not been manufactured for many years, it may be necessary to purchase used chips from places such as eBay. Before using used chips, a pin straightener is quite useful. Well, thank you very much for watching. If you made it this far in the video, you're almost as weird as I am. I salute you. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you next time.